Lord, as we now come to just spend a little bit of time gathering around your word, as always, Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and minds to receive the seed of your word. Make the soil of our lives ready to receive. We are in a time here in this country, Lord, as many countries of the world, where discerning what the truth is, is becoming more and more difficult. And we thank you that your word is spirit and that your word is truth. And so as we look into your word, Lord, we pray that you would guard our minds, you would guard our thinking, that as we live our lives in this world, in amongst all of the flux, that our thinking would be clear, it would be critical, it would be rational, and that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so we commit this time to you now, Lord, and place our focus on you and on your word. Any error, Lord, as always, is mine. All glory, all honour is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, so we're going to continue then with the parables of Jesus. What a surprise. We're going to continue with the parables of Jesus. And we're going to start a new one, because as Shane has already noted, um, I finished the whole parable in one go. Four verses, one sitting. That was amazing. You know, get it done and out the way last week. So the whole parable finished off in one sitting last week. Can we do the same today? No, unlikely. Unlikely. Last week we only had four verses for us to concentrate on. This parable has ten. Ten. And what's that parable? Thank you for asking. What's that parable? Well, today we're going to start to look at the, the great banquet. The parable of the great banquet or the... Uh, great Supper, or whatever it might be subtitled in your particular version of the Bible. It's found in Luke. It's found in Luke chapter 14, uh, in between verses 15 to 24. And basically, when you, when you have a look at this parable, it's really broken up into three parts, I guess. We've got the invitation, followed by a, a series of excuses being made by those that have been invited. And then we've got the outcome. So when you read that parable, we've got the invitation... We've got the excuses, and we've got the outcome. And I think that you'll see that that pretty much neatly divides that parable as we track through it. So what we're going to do, we, as always, we're going to take a quick read through, and then we'll see how we go. And I'm teaching at the moment from the New Living Translation, purely because it's just easy to read, not because it is a great version to study, but it's easy to read. So, Luke 14, 15 to 24. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must expect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. And the servant returned and told his master what they'd said. And his master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And after the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. And so his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. So there we have it. Interesting little parable. And one that will have shaken the listeners to it, as Jesus told it. I can see that you are all shaken. You are all shaken, but you may not yet be stirred. <laughs> yes? Vodka martini, I should shaken, not stirred. I think that was the line. Perhaps not even shaken then, let alone being stirred. But what we're going to do is we're going to look to change that as we track through this. And we're going to look at what Jesus was getting at with his original audience. And then what we're going to do is have a look at what that means for us today. 
What does that mean for us today? And I think it would just be good to remind you that so much of Jesus' teaching was about imminency. Imminency. The theology of imminency, which we have really lost. Imminency. The kingdom of God was present. And the early church had a very clear belief that Jesus could and would return imminently. Any moment. And holding that view in their thinking was key to how they then conducted their lives. His return was imminent, any moment. And if the kingdom of heaven is imminent, if the return of Jesus is imminent, then life's going to be lived differently, isn't it? If you actually live with that thinking at the very front of your mind, everything you do is going to be lived differently. So, let's see how this stacks up. What's the setting for this? What's the setting for this parable? Well, it's likely that this appears to be on the, on the last journey to Jerusalem. And the location may well be in some little village in Galilee. We know from the start of the chapter that it's a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath. And Jesus has been invited to a meal with one of the rulers of the Pharisees. Now, we aren't told who, but we know this much from verse 1. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. Now, it says here in the New Living Translation, the people were watching him closely, which isn't actually the best translation, as I've already uh, alluded to at the beginning of this. It was the Pharisees who were watching him closely. It wasn't the people. The people may well have been doing that, but the scripture actually says it was the Pharisees. It was the Pharisees who had their eyes on him. They had their eyes on him. And the term in the Greek for watching is actually a little bit more graphic than just watching. The term in the Greek actually means and indicates that they were lurking and watching. Lurking and watching. You think of someone just waiting to jump out of the shadows at you. Just when the opportune time came, they were lurking and watching. Yeah? You start to see the setting. They had, their, they had their beady little eyes on him. They had their beady little eyes on him and they were watching him because they were absolutely hell-bent on tripping him up and finding some cause so that they could have a dig at him. And while he was there, other folk would come in, sit at the table. And while they are watching him, Jesus is watching them. He's just sat back. And he's watching other folk come in. And he's watching them. And what he's watching is how folk are jostling for positions around the table. He's watching for the way that people come in to try and snuggle up to the ruler of the Pharisee. So that they can show that they're the favoured one. You see, this was a big thing back in the day. To be seated at the top table. To be seated at the best seat. To be seated closest to the host. Because that indicated that you were someone. You were someone special. We still do it today in our culture, don't we? We still do it today. Banquets, state events, even some more traditional weddings will still have the top table. They'll have the top table reserved for the bride, reserved for the groom and their most important guests. Which actually reminds me, I must talk to my son and daughter about that because I'm not sure I ended up on the top table at their wedding, still. <laughs> I was just out there, wasn't I? Yeah. Hmm. There's, there's a problem, isn't there? There's a problem somewhere with that. I must talk to him. Anyway, I digress. But anyway, the, the, the meal, the meal had all been prepared. The meal had been prepared. The invited guests has all started to arrive. And Jesus knows that he's got beady little eyes on him. He knows that people are lurking and watching. He knows that he's under the microscope. So as he sits back, waiting for folks to turn up, He decides to watch those. Watch the ones that are trying to get closest to the host. Closer to the host, greater position of honour. And so having watched all this play out, Jesus then goes on to give a little bit of advice to the guests that are coming in around him. And he gives them a bit of advice on how to conduct themselves in such settings. And so we read about that actually in Luke 14 verse 7. When Jesus noticed that all had come to the dinner, 
and they were trying to sit in the seats of honour near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honour. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has already been invited? Great way to start a dinner party, eh? Great way. You know, Jesus did get stuck into folk. Can you imagine the, the sort of huffing and the, and the puffing as he began to sort of ruffle the, the feathers of people around him? You know, I reckon that before the main course arrived, they would have already had their fill of him. They really would. They would already have had their fill of him. But he didn't leave it there either, did he? Because after giving the guests a little pointer in humility, what he then does, so he, so he does this to the guests, and then what he does is he turns to the host. He then turns to the host, the chap who has invited him in the first place. And we see this in verse 12 of Luke 14. And so to set the scene for the parable itself, what we're going to do is we're going to read Jesus' comments to the host in full. Because it's those comments in full that then launch us into this parable. So Luke 14, 12 to 14, he's addressed the crowd, the, the, the guests. He now turns his attention to the host. Luke 14, 12 to 14. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives and your rich neighbours. For they'll invite you back and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Mm. Quick question. If you're invited to dinner, and you go and find your place at the table, and you sit down, and then someone else at the table that's already there begins to raise questions about the seating arrangement, and following that, then begins to critique the host as to who he's invited, why he's invited them in the first place. What would you be thinking? Honestly, what kind of thoughts do you think that would sort of flick across your mind? <laughs> who, who does he think he is? Telling, telling me where to sit? Who, who does he think he is presuming to know me? Uh, who does he think he is talking to the host like that? Telling him who he can or he can't invite or who he should or he shouldn't invite. Who, who does he think he is? Wouldn't you? Now, you may all be far better than me, but I think I would naturally have those kind of thoughts sort of flick across my mind. Now, I hope that I would grab them and I would kick them out before they could actually nest in my hair and actually infiltrate my actions and all the rest of it. But I do think those thoughts or something like that would just flick across my thinking. I'd like to think that I would stop them, but they would definitely flash across my thinking. Like I said, you may not, but as I tried to put myself in this story as one of the guests and as the host, I reckon I may have gone down that track as I tried to put myself in the story. So that, then, is the backdrop to this parable. Jesus has been invited to dinner where the intent is for those to lurk in wait for him, to trip him up. And now what he's done is he's pretty much made the guests feel a little bit uncomfortable and he's given the host a bit of a prod about who should and shouldn't have been invited. So that's the lead up into this. You know, is this the most comfortable dinner party so far? And what's the actual kickstart point then? If you look at verse 15, Luke 14, 15. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Hearing what? Hearing what is the first question that I ask on this? Jesus' comments to the guests? Jesus' comments to the host? Yeah, possibly, probably. But I think that this comment is made specifically to counter Jesus' final point to the host. Hearing this, that at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay. repay. Other versions have this, you will be blessed for doing this. You'll be blessed. So this is the point that the response is made to. God will reward or bless you for inviting those who couldn't repay you. And the response was, well, actually, 
those that will be blessed are those that are going to eat bread. Translated here as attend the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, it's the ones who are invited here. They're the ones that are going to be blessed. You're either in or you're out. They're the ones that are going to be blessed. A bit like today, really, isn't it? With some restrictions that we have. You can or you can't enter, depending on what piece of paper you carry around with you. Just picture Jesus. He knows he's under the watchful eye of the Pharisee. He knows he's been set up at this dinner. But he doesn't put any punches, does he? He's already healed someone at the start of the meal. We read about that in verses 2 to 4. That's in there. He's healed somebody at the start of the meal. He's already questioned them about work on the Sabbath, throwing back their own rules and regulations to them, to which they couldn't actually respond. We read about that in verses 5 and 6. And then we've just seen how he's picked them up for a lack of humility in verse 7 to 11. And in verses 12 to 14, he's gone on and had a bit of a dig at the host. All before starters. All before starters. And then this jumped up guest near him seeks to give him a lesson as to who's actually blessed. It's us. The invited ones. Actually, Jesus. Oh, come on. Not the dross outside. Get with the program, Jesus. So I closed my eyes and I tried to put myself there as this guest sort of almost gave that in a sort of snide, cynical, sneering type of response to what Jesus had just laid out to the host in verse 14. Because that's how I picture it. Perhaps the guest was trying to curry favour with the host by sort of chipping in there. Perhaps um, the lesson in humility was actually completely lost on him. Who knows? Or perhaps I see something in the story that really isn't there. I'll let you choose. But Jesus, on hearing that response, now brings his focus of attention on that guest. Sometimes you've got to know when to keep your mouth shut, right? I think that's one of those moments. And we read about it in verse 16, Luke 14, 16. Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. Other versions of scripture say, he said to him. He said to him. New Living Translation doesn't capture that distinction. It just mentions that Jesus replied. But actually, he goes, hmm. You see, I see Jesus now putting this guy under the spotlight. Oh, oh. You think it's about being the invited ones, do you? That's the blessing, is it? The the fact that you were invited. Oh, interesting. Let Let me tell you a little story about this guy who prepared a great feast, and he flicked out loads of invitations. Jesus goes on in Luke 14, 17, and when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. So we need to understand the way things were done back then when it came to events like this. Food in the ancient Near East was extremely important. I don't just mean for sustenance. It was a a social activity. It was a social activity. There was a massive, massive kudos in throwing a party and inviting guests and hospitality was a great... Did you have a party at the weekend, Jace? Did you have a party at the weekend? No? No? I thought you said you went to a party. I was just about to say, I hope you didn't, because I don't recall an invitation. But, you know, throwing a party was a really big thing. It was massive. So we need to try and see that in light of all of this, rather than our rather sort of sterile type of world, just sitting around having a meal type of thing. This event would have seen a huge, huge preparation of a range of food. There would likely have been stacks of people milling around during the course of the day. A whole party type atmosphere going on there. There would have been music, there would have been laughter. Everyone just waiting for that shout, grubs up! Just waiting for it. And we see that the host sends word out to all the invited guests. Note that. The host sends word out to all the invited guests. So he sends the word out. Tell them it's all ready. Tell them the meal has now been prepared during the course of the day. We can now fling open the doors. People can come through. They can now take their place. The party is on, team. Get stuck in. P-A-R-T-Y? 
I just gotta. You know, the party's on, it's happening. It's happening. The invitation has gone out and everyone has accepted it. All that was needed now was for the servant to put out that shout and folk would then come and they would flock into the meal. And so that call by the servant is also something that would have resonated with folk because that's the way it was done back then. The official invite went out. The guests accepted the official invitation. The preparation was all then done to a backdrop of laughing, music, expectation. And then the servant would bring the call. The invitation would then be articulated and folk who were invited and who had accepted would then be called in. So it's almost like a two-stage invitation, right? There's the letter, now you get the verbal. Come on, it's all ready, come on in. Brad Young in his book on the parables, he cites a similar type of practice which was still being used in the Middle East in 1857. And this is recorded in a book by... Uh, a chap called W. M. Thompson, who was who had lived in the Middle East for around about 25 years in 1857, and it, uh, it, he records it in his in his work, The Land and the Book. And it goes like this: I noticed that the friend at whose house we dined last evening sent a servant to call us when dinner was ready. Is this custom generally observed? Not very strictly among the common people, nor in cities where Western manners have greatly modified the Oriental, but in Lebanon it still prevails. If a sheikh, beg, or emir invites, he always sends a servant to call you at the proper time. This servant often repeats the very formula mentioned in Luke 14, 17. Tefudula el achshad hada. Tefudula el achshad hada. Come, for the supper is ready. Come, for the supper is ready. The fact that this custom is mainly confined to the wealthy and to the nobility is in strict agreement with the parable, where the certain man who made the great supper and bade many is supposed to be of this class. It is true now, as then, that to refuse is a high insult to the maker of the feast. Nor would such excuses as those in the parable be more acceptable to a Druze emir than they were to the lord of this great supper. But, however angry... Very few would manifest their displeasure by sending the servants into the highways and hedges after the poor, the maimed, the halt and the blind. All these characters are found in abundance in our streets, and I have known rich men who filled out the costume of the parable even in these particulars. It was, however, as matter of ostentation, to show the extent of their benevolence and the depth of their humility and condescension. Nevertheless, it is pleasant to find enough of the drapery of this parable still practised to show that originally it was, in all its details, in close conformity to the customs of this country. Now, that just goes to show that this was something that was still being practised in a certain type of form, with that call going out from the servant. So there's nothing that Jesus has said so far, up to this point of the parable, that would have raised any eyebrows. This was just bulk standard stuff, totally in keeping with expectations of the day. Invitation goes out, preparation happens, doors get open, servant calls. Come on in, it's all ready. Nice and simple. The time for eating and feasting had now come. And it was now for everyone to just crack on. And everybody would have sat there going, tell me something I don't know, Jesus. And what? So we then get to verse 18. But they all began making excuses. Ooh. Now, I stop there because this would have had the man that Jesus is speaking to sort of under that thing, the microscope. And I think he would have began to squirm a little bit. But... They all began making excuses. It would also very likely have had the people around listening squirm a little as well. Uh, (laughs) You don't do that. You don't make excuses when you have already accepted the invitation to the meal. You don't do that. All the prep work, all that work being done to fail to turn up now was a really big social faux pas. It was a really big thing. Each of those invited guests 
had accepted the invitation. They'd already accepted the invitation. In effect, in our parlance, they had already RSVP'd. They'd already RSVP'd. The response of them, as soon as that servant put out that second call, should have been, woohoo! This is what we've all been waiting for. Yes, since we first accepted that invitation, this is what we've been waiting for. Now's the time. Now's the moment. But they began making excuses. And what they did was they made one lame excuse after another, with the exception of one excuse, which was not quite so lame. And I think that Jesus actually adds this to inject a little bit of humour into the situation. Verse 18 notes, they all began making excuses. And this was a unanimous decision, almost like they had collaborated with each other. They all agreed to no show. This would have been an absolute terrible insult to the host. This would have been a terrible... This is an honour-shame culture. This would have been a terrible, terrible insult. The, The one who had spent time, energy, effort, money on prepping this feast all day. And remember that the ancient Near East, as the Middle East still is today has this deep-rooted principle of honour and shame. Honour and shame. How much shame would have been heaped up on the head of the host? How much shame? he would have been the talk of villagers for years to come, potentially. A bit like our little dog when we put the helmet of shame on him, you know? Do you remember when so-and-so threw that party? Do you remember that? And all those guests were just dissed him. They just dissed him, even after having initially accepted that invitation. Oh, the shame. Oh, the shame. Who's that? It's not Pumbaa, is it? It's it's Lion King. Who's Timon? Oh, the shame. Yeah, it's one of those Timon and Pumbaa moments. Oh, the shame. We've seen the invitation. That's the invitation. First section, we've seen it. Now we've moved on to the excuses. And so what Jesus does is he uses a very typical folklore style of storytelling in that he rolls out a series of threes. Series of threes. We've all seen it, haven't we? This type of thing's been carried on for generations. We see it in our little stories. Three little pigs. Three blind mice. Goldilocks and the (coughs) three bears. The three billy goats gruff. And then we get that other most important, wonderful story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. (laughs) Those three. So we get that as well. But Jesus carries on in verse 18 with the first one up. But they all began making excuses, and one said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. The first guest rolls out this excuse that he's bought a field and he's got to inspect it. This might be missed on us. But again, I'm sure the original hearers would have been going, what? Standing there scratching their heads. That's that's not an excuse. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. Stupid is, stupid does. It really is stupid. The first guest had accepted the invitation, and in between that and the servant shouting him to advise him the meal was ready to come and take his place, he purchased this bit of land. But the excuse he uses is that he's purchased a bit of land, and now he needs to go and inspect it. You, You don't buy something you haven't already checked out do you you don't buy something you haven't already maybe some people might do but you don't normally buy something that you haven't already inspected and this particular greek word doesn't even indicate what i would term an inspection this is more of a mechanical passive or casual vision oh i've just got a new field i just want to go and have a look at it got a new field just want to go and have a look at it if you've purchased a new field you would have had a look at it before the purchase. So this makes yeah, the whole premise of this excuse pretty redundant, to be honest. Can't it wait? Can't, can't you just come to the meal and s- sit, eat, and, and then go and look at that wonderful field that you've just bought a bit later on? Can't, can't you do that? Clearly not. So this very worthless excuse, this is a worthless excuse, now takes precedence over what the guest should have been doing, which was coming in to eat. Let me just bring this into our walk with Jesus. How often do we do that? How 
often do we elevate something that is completely worthless over him? The one that is actually of value and the one that we ought to be making the point of our focus. How often do we do that? Too often, I fear. And it can take all sorts of shapes and forms in our life, can't it? Elevating the business concern or the professional concern or the social concern over and above the one thing that we ought to be focusing on. And that is sitting at a table and fellowshipping with him. But we prioritise things that are worthless. Things that can be casually looked on rather than things that we should be spending our time on. There would have been a few heads lowered as Jesus put this excuse out on the table there. In much the same way as perhaps some of us should do so. And then he continues, doesn't he, in verse 19. And another said, so this is the second guy. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. So the second guy pops up with his little excuse. Oh, well, me too. I've got five pairs of oxen. Just need to give them a run. Need to give them a try out. Israel was an agricultural society. All of those folk listening to this would have seen the inherent fallacy of this excuse as well. You don't buy oxen without first checking them out. You didn't do that. The whole thing is farcical. And the listeners knew it. They knew it. It's like that, oh, I've just got a new car, I'm just going to have to take it for a spin. Can't come to church, just got a new car, I've got to take it for a spin. What? <laughs> Can't come to dinner, I've got a new car, I've got to take it for a spin. Oh, what? Really? That's your excuse? Come on, be a bit more creative. That's pretty, that's pretty rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish as excuses go. Like you wouldn't have done that already, right, before buying it. You take your car out for a spin when you go to buy it, don't you? You get in it, you try, you test it out, and you drive it. And you take it for a spin. And then you go, yeah, I'll have that. Thanks very much. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't come around and see you. I've got a new car. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Just another excuse. Putting something else above sitting down at the table and fellowshipping with the host. And so Jesus throws this excuse out to the crowds at the table and... It says, as you pick up your starters, have a chew on that as well. Have a chew on that one. And they would have all seen that again, it was no excuse at all. No excuse. And guest one and guest two are noted as politely refusing to come. Same Greek word used for both of them as they decline. It's like, uh, thanks so much for the invite. I know I accepted it, but other things have come up between now and, uh, and then, so I'm going to take a rain check. But thanks for the invitation. Pretty rubbish excuses. In the light of all of the effort that the host has gone in, setting all of this up, getting all of this stuff out for the guests, getting everybody in to sit around the dinner, and all of those guests that were sat there at that dinner with the rule of the Pharisees knew that they were lame excuses. So by this time, they're probably feeling a little bit flat, a little bit disheartened. I mean, Jesus has had a little bit of a run with them so far. And so now he gets to verse 20. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And I reckon that it was at this point that Jesus has now had a bit of a laugh. And you can probably hear a bit of a chuckle going around the table. God, the bloke's just got married. Of course he can't come. He's got far more important things to think about than food. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Or perhaps, or perhaps even... Well, now he's got a wife, he's no longer wearing the trousers. Yeah, no wonder he can't come. Yeah, yeah, we get that. We get that, Jesus. Yeah, we understand that. Or perhaps it was a combination of both. Who knows? This guy does not politely decline. He just refuses. I've just got married, I can't come. In fact, in the Greek, it actually says he doesn't have the power or permission to come. So it's probably the latter, isn't it, that he's no longer wearing the trousers. It says, I haven't got the power or permission to come. I can't come. I haven't got the power. I've just got married. Uh, am I allowed to go? No, not allowed to go. No, you can't do it. No, you can't go. So perhaps, either way, I think that this would have drawn a bit of a smile, perhaps. Because it's a bit different from the other excuses, which are very, very lame. And then every married man would have gone, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Probably not. <laughs> all up, though, all up, none of those excuses were good enough. None of them. Because the invitations had been received. The, the banquet had been prepared. And that banquet is ready right now for them to step into and the response should have been woohoo but it wasn't it was one lame excuse after another they may, have, may well have, have received the invitation they may well have replied but what they didn't recognise or respond to was the hour and there's a significant point here no, no excuse would be justified in refusing the call to attend. No excuse. In the Jewish understanding of the day, the invited guests could not just refuse to turn up. They had to turn up. A refusal like that was a major slap in the face of the host. And it actually brought shame on him and on his name. So, how does that apply to us today? I've already touched on it as we've tracked through. What are we elevating over and above our willingness to sit with Jesus in fellowship? Fellowship with him, fellowship with others. Fellowship by spending time in his word. Because it is far too easy to buy into the narrative that church just doesn't matter. I, I can do my own thing. I, I can just be Christian. I don't have to attend church to be Christian. No, no, you're right. You don't. But when you do, it will help sharpen you as a Christian. So get over yourself. And stop looking for the perfect church. Because if you do find one, as soon as you walk into it, it will no longer be perfect. So get over yourselves. Oh, I, I, I don't have time to spend in fellowship with the word. Then you know what? Get your head out of Netflix. Get your head out of social media. Get your head out of whatever distraction it is that is robbing you of your time. And discipline yourself. Discipline. You have been invited. You must respond to that follow-up call. The table is ready. There is urgency. There is urgency. There is imminency about this. Do it or lose it. What does losing it look like? Well, we've covered the invitation. We've covered the excuses. What does losing it look like? Well, that will have to be next week. Because that will be the outcomes. That will be the outcomes. Great. I hope, and I think you can see the point that Jesus is making to his original listeners. And I think that we would do really well to look at those general principles that can then be applied to our life today in the 21st century. Summing it up, excuses aren't good enough and they are a slap in the face of the host. Who's our host? Our excuses aren't good enough. And we'll work on the outcomes next week. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank you for the beauty of it. And Lord, I so personally thank you for the gritty realism of it. You did not pull your punches, Lord. And we recognise that too often we make excuses about how we respond to that second call from you in terms of and particularly in terms of fellowshipping with others and with you. Lord, keep us aware of things that can so easily distract us. 
easily divert our attention from who you are and those things that prevent us from becoming the type of people that you want us to be. And Lord, I pray that you wake up your church and that you meet with folk individually so that they can deal with you directly regarding their own excuses. Help us to realise, Lord, the imminency of things, the urgency of the hour that we live in, so that our lives will be fragrant to you and our time on this planet will be honouring to you and to your name. And it is in your name, dear Lord, that we pray. Amen.